Hey folks, and welcome to our third and final installment on Beaudry. We're going to be talking about Rear Window and that last part of his essay, which is about identification. So the title of that last part of his essay is The Screen Mirror, Specularization and Double Identification. Specular is just an adjective that means of a mirror or of reflections. And double identification refers to the fact that for Beaudry, there are two forms of identification, ways we identify with narrative movies. So I want to look at this passage. He says, the arrangement of the different elements, uh, projection, dark and tall screen, in addition from reproducing in a striking way the mise-en-scene of Plato's cave, reconstructs the situation necessary to the release of the mirror stage discovered by Lacan. So we're going to get to the mirror stage in a bit because that's more foundational to what's going on here. But I want us to first look at this reference to Plato's cave because I think it's incredibly useful for understanding what Baudry is trying to do and also reflect the general suspicion that uh, permeates 1968 and after film theory in France and the United States. So what is Plato's cave? And a lot of you probably know what Plato's cave is, um, but let me just kind of rehearse what it's all about. Plato being the ancient Greek philosopher who writes an allegory of the cave that he thinks is a good reflection of how he thinks reality and perception happen in the real world. So in the, in the allegory that he writes, we have these prisoners who are chained up in a cave and the entire reality that they think exists is constituted by these shadows that are cast on the wall. They think that this is a representation of the real world. But really what this is is just shadows cast by objects produced by people that they never see, people that are out of their perceptual view. And moreover, they have no idea that the real reality is the thing outside the cave. So why would Plato write this? And why is this an allegory? And an allegory for what? Well, it's an allegory for the fact that for Plato, humans' perceptual access to the world is in some sense false. Plato thinks that actual things in the world are merely reflections of the true world of the forms that exist beyond our per perceptual comprehension of what we think of as material things. Plato is an idealist philosopher. That's what Baudry means by topological model of idealism. It's a broad school of thought and philosophy that privileges abstractions over our perception of material reality. Plato is suspicious of perception as giving us an access to truth. He thinks that the table in front of me is just a reflection or a copy of the true form of the table that exists in this other realm. In many ways, Baudry's theory of the apparatus of film is analogous to Plato's allegory of the cave, because Baudry's trying to remind us about all the ways in which what we see on screen, just like the shadows for the prisoners, is not reality, but a transformation of it. Okay, so that's Plato's cave. Let's move on to the more important and really more influential part of this part of uh, Baudry's essay, which is about the mirror stage discovered by Lacan. So who is Lacan? He's, uh, Jacques Lacan is a famous and influential French philosopher who bases his work on the workings of Sigmund Freud. In a nutshell, Lacan is reworking a lot of Freud's ideas, but infusing the importance of language and language ac acquisition into Freud's ideas. We don't have to get into that, but I want us to just look at this one theory that was really influential on film theory for obvious reasons. It's called the mirror stage. It's basically Lacan's theory of how we as human beings come to form this idea of our subjectivity or our sense of self as subjects. And when Lacan says subject, he's very much saying it in the same way that Baudry and his pal Louis Althusser are saying it. That is, Lacan wants to maintain that subjecthood is partly a fiction, that it's partly a falsehood. So Lacan tells us that at a certain point in a child or an infant's development, it looks at itself in the mirror and it recognizes itself in the mirror. And then it identifies with that image in the mirror. Baudry will say, quote, this phase, this mirror phase, generates via the mirror image of a unified body the constitution or at least the first sketches of the eye as an imaginary function. The image in the mirror is not necessarily a true image of who you are as a self, but rather as a infant, you are trying to grasp your sense of self. Your attachment to your image in the mirror is importantly an idealized image of the self. And this is important to realize that a mirror image is not necessarily a good representation of a truthful or accurate image. After all, a mirror image is always a distortion of ourselves. And of course, even a picture of our bodies is not the same thing as ourselves. 
So what Lacan will say is that this mirror stage is setting off a process that will happen all throughout your life. That is, your sense of self, that I that you have in your head, is formed by continually looking for selves or pictures of yourself in the exterior world. And what's a great example of this? For Baudry, it's cinema. So Baudry is saying that cinema, looking at the screen, often with people, is another way of continually looking for a sense of self or subjectivity in the exterior world. And again, it's idealized. It's not true. And more than that, one of Baudry's most interesting points is that on top of this, there are two complementary conditions that lead to this sense of self in the mirror. Immature powers of mobility and a precocious maturation of visual organization. In other words, he's saying that just as an infant does not have a mastery of its mobility and that its visual faculties are more advanced than its ability to move around, it's similar to how in movies we are forced to sit still and we are engaging with, all, with this world primarily through our eyes. And what's really nice about Rear Window is it allegorizes this very condition. Because what is the thing that sets the entire narrative in motion? Well, the fact that Jimmy Stewart's character is rendered immobile through an accident. And this condition intensifies a faculty of his selfhood that has already been in place. He is a photographer. He engages with the world visually. Not only that, as a photographer, he approaches the world as a subject and the contents of the world are an object for his visual comprehension. So for Baudry, there are two levels of identification in movies. The first level is that of a character, identifying with characters in movies. The second level being the camera, or whatever it is that is responsible for the images that you see. You somehow identify with that force that is picturing a world in front of you. Don't forget this, it'll be important later, because Laura Mulvey is going to make a lot of identification in her feminist theory of film. So let's look at what Baudry says. He says, first, attached to the image itself derives from the character portrayed as a center of secondary identifications, carrying an identity which constantly must be seized and reestablished. What does he mean here? Well, he's pointing out the fact that one convention of classical Hollywood storytelling is that there are protagonists. Yes, we know that you can tell a narrative story without having a protagonist. Our friend Eisenstein made Battleship Potemkin in which there is barely a protagonist, partly because he thinks protagonist is a function of bourgeois ideology, and especially individualism. But Rear Window is very much a classical Hollywood story that has a protagonist. Not only that, it exaggerates the role of a protagonist, or a locus of primary identification, because the world very much revolves around the way that Jimmy Stewart sees and thinks and feels and fears things. His goals matter more than anyone else's. The second kind of identification is with the camera. Baudry will say, the second level permits the appearance of the first and places it in action. That is the transcendental subject whose place is taken by the camera, which constitutes and rules the objects in this world. So in other words, he's saying that the previous section, the transcendental subject, is a full account of what it feels like to identify with the picturing thing, the thing that pictures the images on screen. He'll say, thus the spectator identifies less with what is represented, the spectacle itself, than with what stages the spectacle, makes it seen, obliging him to see what it sees. So Baudry's making this kind of claim here. He thinks that this identification is more important or has a more central role in uh, fostering or entrenching uh, subjectivity than does identifying with characters. Do you agree with that? That's an interesting place to maybe respond to Baudry. So remember that the film begins with a moving camera that kind of occupies the position of Jeff, but he is sleeping. And it is kind of giving us an image of the world outside of Jeff's apartment, but it is not actually allied with Jeff. And not only that, there are other moments in Rear Window, which is famously a film that tries to identify the storytelling point of view centrally with a character. There are points in this film in which it breaks away from this habit. This is one of those events. Notice at this point in the film that Jeff is falling asleep. He is trying to watch the suspicious behaviors of his neighbors, in particular, one neighbor, Thorwald. Remember, at this moment in the film, Thorwald mysteriously has been going out into the night with, uh, with a big suitcase. Um, he is a salesman, but this is in the middle of the night and it's raining. Why is he doing so? Jeff really wants to watch him. But note, the camera will show Jeff 
right here, he's getting sleepy. And so if this film, Rear Window, is really as attached to Jeff's subjectivity as people think it is, we might say, move on to the next scene. But that doesn't exactly happen. The camera returns. Notice what happens right here. Jeff is shown sleeping, but the camera says, no, I'm gonna show you more than Jeff knows by panning to the right and showing an event that we should think is extremely important. We can see that Thorwald exits his apartment in the morning with a woman, a woman who very well could be his wife, but Jeff didn't see it because he's sleeping. Thus, the film is actually showing us the difference between the first level of identification and the second level of identification, and almost reinforcing, in some way, what Baudry is saying about the primacy of second level identification. In the classical Hollywood storytelling, the camera or the unseen narrator or whoever is responsible for the image itself always knows more than the characters within the world, or at least this is a tendency. And it's a tendency that Baudry might think is a particularly satisfying one for establishing a sense of dominant, self-transparent subjectivity. So here we might ask a question just to do this work of reading Rear Window through the film theory of Jean-Louis Baudry. We might ask, if our primary identification is with Jeff and our secondary identification is with the camera or with whoever or whatever is responsible for the images that we see, what functions as Jeff's primary and secondary identification, given that Jeff is often understood in film criticism as an allegory for the cinematic spectator? Well, remember that throughout the film, Jeff in some sense identifies with the people that he sees across from his, his apartment. On some level, Jeff even identifies with the quote unquote antagonist, Thorwald. Because after all, if this film is about anything, it's about marriage and a certain view of marriage that pits it against the freedom and individualism of a rugged independent lifestyle. So notice that throughout the film, Jeff is going to view his neighbors as in some sense reflecting his own values and reinforcing his own worldview. In this, in this moment, he's talking about the composer who, and he says he lives alone, probably had a very unhappy marriage. He has no grounding for that kind of claim, but, but he is projecting his own sense of self onto the people that he's seeing. And famously, of course, the neighbors have different versions of marital relations. There's Miss Lonely Hearts, who has a vision of what happens when you could be alone. There is, there's the newlyweds, there's Thorwald and his unhappy marriage. There's the funny little couple with the dog. These are all different versions that are mirroring, in some sense, Jeff's primary narrative conflict, which is about what to do with his relationship. Well, what about secondary identification? Would it make sense to say that Jeff, in some way, identifies with the images that he produces by looking at this fantasy world outside of his apartment? Well, in some ways, yes. Think of the story that's being told. Jeff begins by explaining that he doesn't feel whole, right? He says, Gunnison, you gotta get me out of here. He's defined by his work, which is about action and exploration and visual primacy, but he's confined to his apartment. So he needs a way to become a subject again, somebody who enacts their will on the world, somebody who has agency, who isn't merely a product of their environment. He could, of course, look for meaning in his relationship with Lisa, but he doesn't want that because he believes that the development of that relationship, which means marriage, is another imposition of stasis, something that would hamper his own subjectivity, his selfhood. He wants to keep things status quo in his relationship. That is, he wants to hamper the development of, his, of the actual world so that he can dive into the fantasy of the world outside of his apartment, which is, in effect, a movie, something that is constituted purely by his visual spectation of it. So he picks up his camera and his telephoto lens as a way of finding a sense of self. He completely throws himself into a world of spectatorship. You might say Jeff's act of looking, which is reinforced by his apparatus specific condition, that is being immobile, constitutes his selfhood and his subjectivity, which the film presents us as in crisis. This is one way of, of seeing the film as an allegory for what Baudry says about cinema in general. Quote, the reality mimed by the cinema is thus first of all that of a self that what we're searching for in cinema and what cinema gives us is a solid but illusory and false 
sense of subjectivity or selfhood. Okay, that's it for Beaudry, and I'll see you next time.